Hey, uh, Pastor Mike was sharing on Sunday about the, the different advocates that we have. Of course, Jesus Christ being the first advocate, uh, uh, that he is the righteous one that represents us before the Father. Thank God. And then we got the Holy Spirit as advocate tonight. Really, uh, the thing that I want to talk about uh, tonight is really uh, the main theme is is hearing from God. I don't know about you, and I think Miss Kim said this the other day to me, but I don't know about you, but I think one of the most important things that the, the church at large has to learn in, in this hour and continuing on is to being intimate with him enough so that we know his voice. Because don't you know that we are in a time and it's only becoming more and more per important as we see events take place that it's not man's plans and man's solutions that's going to win the day. It's just like the whole Syria thing right now. It's a complete mess. My, pro or, or my prayer is that Lord come in and just be Lord over Syria. You know what? Let's not just rush into things Let's, I, I told, uh, I, I emailed uh, Stephen Palazzo, my representative in Congress, and said, you know what, let's have Congress have a day of prayer and fasting. Seeking God for Syria. Lord, you move in their hearts. You bring something righteous out of it. Because, really, it doesn't look like a, a good, you know, outcome. It's not a win-win in there anywhere. What's the deal? You know, you got evil on both sides, and really it is the lesser of two evils. So I believe in this hour and in the ongoing days that we need to have an intimacy with the Lord where we're going to need to know his voice better and better and better. And personally, myself, I, I want to know the Lord's voice. You know, we want to hear what he is showing to us. We want to hear that. We want to see that. We want to perceive whatever before him. So I want to just talk about hearing from the Holy Spirit. And we learned on Sunday that an advocate is a person who pleads for another uh, on behalf of another. Uh, the thing is, you can have the best advocate in the world in which we do, the Holy Spirit. We can have the best advocate and give the best advice to us. But you know what? If we don't listen first of all, to hear something, to receive something, and if we don't obey, it's like not having an advocate at all. We might as well just go out in our boat and sail on down the way because we haven't learned anything. I love those uh, home shows. I don't know if anybody watches HGTV, but it cracks me up. They'll get these first-time rehabbers that go out and they buy these houses and they, they want to do this, and they like want to personalize it. And hey, we're gonna we're gonna cut it down from a three bedroom to a two bedroom, and we're gonna do this. And you know, then they've got the expert who has done I don't know how many of these things in their lives. And they come in and they go, well, you know what? I wouldn't change out the kitchen cabinets. I would just go ahead and just refinish them, leave them there. They're in great shape. I mean, what do they do? They pull them out, and they buy whole new cabinets and all these different things. And so you got someone with all this experience and all this wisdom, but yet the person that's walking out the process doesn't give them two cents worth of attention. And so they miss all the, the good advice that is there. And so it makes the process harder. So we can have the best advocate, but we've got to listen, and then we need to obey. Because if we're we're not really listening if we're not obeying. We can receive something. I can receive sound waves on my eardrums, but it doesn't mean it gets here. And so then, because if, if it gets here, then I can walk something out in the process. Fran was at uh, Regent University, and she was in a counseling class where they had to watch this film. I don't even remember the name of that film. You probably remember, though. It was a crazy film. Anyway, it's about family dynamics because she was in counseling. And so, so they had to write a paper on basically the, you know, the diagnosis of the family, what would you do, that sort of thing. And so her and her friend were sitting there with their laptops, 
watching the movie together. So as they were watching the movie together, they're talking to another. And then they've got their laptops, and so they're sitting there kind of inadvertently, they didn't know, but they're putting the same types of phrases in there and stuff like that. So they, they both write their papers, and I remember the day that she wrote the paper, it was probably like a Saturday or something, we are just hanging out, she's writing, I'm around the house, all that sort of stuff. Well, she, get, she turns, and then she gets, uh, what do you get? You get a call from, go to the final. Oh, go to the final. Isn't this great? Go to the final. I'm going to go take the final. And they get called into the dean's office and basically said that they cheated. They colluded together. They wrote their papers together. So anyway, it's a long process. But we ended up, there was a meeting between the teacher, and this is like the provost of the university, and all this stuff. Uh, that was going on because we appealed the whole thing. I mean, this is just crazy. They didn't cheat. They worked together, but they didn't cheat. They didn't collude. So anyway, we go into this meeting, and we had hired an advocate. We had hired an attorney to help represent not only Fran, but our friend Kathy in the process. And you know what? If we had walked in there by ourselves and these two girls by themselves, it would have been a very intimidating situation because they had their three, four, five people lined up on the other side of the table. And Paul's back there shaking his head. You're probably identifying with this. But we listened to our advocate. They told their side of the story, and he came in and began to kind of just dismantle the process. He was a great guy. Uh, I was in on the process. Um, but, but don't you know that if Kathy or Fran said, you know what, I'm not going to take your advice, Doug. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just going to speak up when I want to speak up. You know, it, it could have turned out completely different. It did turn out being that they were completely exonerated from that, praise God. And there was a lot of prayer behind that and all that sort of stuff. But don't you know, sometimes it's just good to have an advocate. And I was thinking about this. It's like sometimes God involves you in the process a little bit more. But other times God just says, you know what? You just stay right there. You just stand still and see the salvation of the Lord and allow me to work on your behalf. You don't need to do anything. You can just get in the prayer closet. You can cry out to me and I'll take care of it. Now, sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes he's asking you, hey, this is what I want you to do. I want you to walk this out. I want you to be involved in it. So an advocate is a great thing. You know, God speaks from Genesis to Revelation. He loves to speak to his children. And so I want to talk just a little bit about uh, God speaking, uh, some of the hindrances uh, from hearing that sort of thing. So I'm going to do that tonight. But also at the end of this, uh, I just want to share a word. I think it's very appropriate to uh, some of the stuff that we just sung. So I know that God's in the place, and he's got a word for you tonight. So... Let's go ahead and continue to jump into this. You know what? God speaks in different ways. You know, he spoke uh, to Moses in the fire on the mountain. Uh, Abraham angelic, had angelic encounters. Joseph dreamed dreams. Ezekiel and Amos and other prophets had tremendous visions. And Elijah, it was just a still, small voice or a whisper. I love it that God gets real creative with Balaam and speaks through a donkey. Yes, he can, he can do that. He could still do that today if he wants to. Uh, he speaks to Samuel and the prophets through prophetic words and spoke to Paul and other New Testament believers through the promptings and, of the Holy Spirit, the warnings of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, God can speak any which way he wants to. He's really not limited. Of course, our main way of hearing him is going to be through this right here, that the Logos becomes the rhema word of God as we're sitting here and we're reading this and the impression of the Lord comes upon us, that as we read, it becomes life to us. It's just not words on a page, but it imparts life. It imparts encouragement and strength into our hearts. But you know, God speaks in funny ways in odd ways. 
Um, he'll use billboards. He'll use license plates. If you're open, he'll speak to you. You know, if you got an ear to hear, God will speak to you. And, he, and actually, he admonishes us to hear. If you have an ear to hear, it's really, in the in Greek, it's more of a command. Hey, open up your ear. I've got something to say to you. I want to speak to you. And so, we need to heed the voice of the Lord and to have a heart that wants to hear. I know that when we were still in Birmingham, and this is before I had even made any contact with Pastor Mike or the church down here, Molly Francis was probably about four years of age at the time. Would you say so, Fran? She was about four years old. And I think she was, I don't know if she was in the car with Fran or around the dinner table. But it just comes blurting out of her mouth one night and she starts talking about our new house. A new house. And we're like, what are you talking about, darling? She's like, you know, the new house that we're getting. That God is giving us. Exactly. Four years old. God's moving through her to speak. Your kids pick up on things, you know, that are right there. And it will be life-giving to you. Um, nature. God speaks through nature. So, you know, the thing is, is that we are wired. We are wired to hear from the Lord, to have fellowship with him. When we, we received his spirit into our hearts, we became one with the Lord in spirit. 1 Corinthians 6.17 says that. But, you know, I don't know if you're like me, and I'm, but I'm sure that you are. Sometimes the connection isn't that good, is it? I have problems on the reception side sometimes. It was Sunday morning, I was out there with Linda Thee, and I was joking with her. And we had turned on the TV, but the signal wasn't coming yet. And so the TV just had it flashing up there, searching for signal, searching for signal, searching for signal. And I said to Linda, I said, hey, that's the way I am sometime with God. <laughs> that you, it's not that he's not putting out something. It says, I'm here with my antenna dish trying to, okay, where are you, Lord? Where are you? What do you say? point in time but there are hindrances that come into our lives you know one of the uh, things that comes to immediately to mind i'm just going to share just a few of them is that we've got too many competing voices vying for our attention would you say that we're just bombarded i mean you could get up in the morning starting as soon as or before you get out of bed when you pick up the phone and you got emails, texts, you're checking Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever. And, and you're so connected that you really, it's a hard time then unplugging from that and connecting to the Lord. Because you know what? God can send encouragement through Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Certainly he can use anything, right? But you know what? Sometimes he, he wants undivided attention. And I'm not saying that you have to get up and uh, this is the way to do it or anything like that, but I'm just saying that the Lord wants to spend time with you. He loves you, and he wants to speak to your heart. So too many competing voices. Sometimes we need to turn off the media, turn off the TV, turn off the pundits, turn off ESPN, you know, all that sort of stuff. No, 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 ESPN's okay. You can keep ESPN on. Number two is that we're busy, we're distracted. Um, we're probably one of the busiest generations that there has ever been. I don't even know if we're getting that much work done, but we're busy. You know, and, and we've got a lot of things going on. And so we can easily are distracted by things. Luke 21, 34 talks about a heavy heart. It says this, it says, be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing drunkenness and the anxieties of life and that day will close on you suddenly like a trap. I find this interesting here because we've got two words. We've got a triumvirate of words, three words here, a grouping that goes together. 
And he starts off with talking about carousing, or talks about uh, in other translations, dissipation, where basically it's just like, you know what, I'm going to go on my merry way. I'm going to do what I want to do. And in the process, I'm going to imbibe a little bit, and life's going to be good, and I'm going to kind of escape from things and, uh, you know, take some liquor in and, and, and just have a fun time, have, have, have a good time. And he takes it a little step further. And he says drunkenness. That, that going to a place, it's not just about having some fun now. It's not a, just about uh, getting a little tipsy or, or that sort of thing. But it's, you know, I, I'm really going to indulge myself in drunkenness. But I'm going to drink what I want to do and I'm going to go to the hilt. You know what? When we do that, what happens to us physically? We're inebriated. Uh, we lose our sense of judgment, right? Uh, we may not even be able to ha remember conversations that we had with people the next day. You know, I had conversations, talked to you, but wake up in the morning, I got a splitting headache, and I don't even know what's going on at that point in time. You, you can begin to act like a real fool if you go to that. And then the Lord puts this in there. The anxieties of life. Or in some uh, transaction or excuse, translation says the cares of this life. Has anybody got any cares that they can care about? You got things that are just going on in your life? We begin to let the cares pile up. And if we get too many of that stuff going on, because he really said, don't, don't carry your cares around. And Peter says, cast all your care on the Lord. Right? We're to cast the care. We're to shoot it over to him and let him take care of it. But I think we've all been in a place where we start picking up the cares. We can get ourselves under the burden. We can get ourselves inebriated by the cares of this life and so that we are no longer sober-minded in which the Bible exhorts us to be. So we cannot hear the Lord correctly. We cannot hear his voice in the midst of that because my heart now is completely weighed down. I've, I've been in places like that where that I've gotten a prophetic word in a small group. Couldn't even receive the word just because the cares of life. I had let the cares of life weigh my heart down so much that I was like, yeah, I'm sure that's going to come to pass. I'm being honest. Pretty flippant attitude, but that's where I was at the time. So the cares of life can be a tremendous hindrance to hearing from the Lord. Next is a hard heart. A hard heart that we've let our, that let our heart come to a place of being offended with God and we've come to a place where it's like it's not just weighed down, but it's actually crusty now at this point in time. So I want to move over to aids to hearing from the Lord. And let's turn to Psalm 95 together because one of the greatest things that we can do to hear from the Lord is worship. Is worship. Now the thing is, we can't worship for the purpose of, of hearing from the Lord. You, you think I might be contradicting myself up here. But actually, if we worship like we were worshiping just a few minutes ago, where we were just crying out to God and giving our heart to Him, that is where God will move. That is where the type of environment that God will speak. But if I go into a, a worship experience, if I go to go in and bless the Lord and praise Him specifically so I can get tuned into Him so that I can hear? You know what's going to happen? I'm probably not going to hear Him. <laughs> I'm not, probably not going to hear Him because I'm seeking after something from Him instead of seeking Him. Not that He's not kind and not that He's not gracious, gracious and gentle. And he may speak to you in situations like that. That's absolutely fine. But scripture would show us to worship in Psalm 95 here. It says, 
O come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. So we're, we're just going in with exuberant praise. For the Lord is the great God and the great King above all gods. In his hands are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands form the dry land. That he's done everything that is possible on the earth. That he is worthy of praise. And it goes on, and it goes from exuberant praise to a place of worship where we surrender. It's a different heart attitude. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. It's a place of being prostrate before the Lord. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. You know what? We can be grateful that we are the sheep of His hand, the sheep of His pasture, and that His hand's upon us in that place of worship. Then it goes on to say, so we go from this exuberant praise into a place of surrender and really calling upon the Lord and worshiping Him. And then the writer says this. Changes subject totally. Today, if you will hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness. When your fathers tested me, they tried me, though they saw my work. It's like he completely changes gears, completely changes subjects. Worship, worship worship and then all of a sudden talks about today if you hear his voice worship is one of the most powerful ways that we can connect with god that helps our heart our spirit to line up with him so that we can begin to hear his voice and that he has a place to speak to us it says do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion as in the day of trial in the wilderness what can we learn from that experience? Let us flip over to Exodus 17 that talks about when they tried him. Exodus 17, 2. It says, therefore, well, all the congregation, I'll start at one, all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin according to the commandment of the Lord encamped in Rephidim, but there was no water. There was no water for the people to drink. That's what started the complaining and the grumbling. Therefore the people contended with Moses and said, give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, why is it you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses then cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. Not a pretty picture at all. First thing that I see in this, where the people of God missed it, Israel, is that they looked to leadership to provide an answer that man could not provide, only God could. Thank God for leadership. Thank God for godly leadership. But don't you know that if we look to man, because if, if we elevate man in any point or position, we're going to be sorely disappointed. Eventually, that leadership is going to disappoint us. If you're, if you're thinking salvation is coming from the Republicans for our nation, you're going to be sorely disappointed. If you think it's coming from the Democrats for our nation, you're going to be sorely disappointed because a man-centered philosophy and a man-centered response is not what is going to work, not just for our nation, but for our individual lives also. So number one is they looked to leadership. They looked to man instead of God. That was the first thing that we can learn there. But also the other thing is that the people quickly forgot about the goodness and the faithfulness of God because of the harsh circumstances that they were in. 
This is the Lord that had just delivered the people of Israel out of Egypt where they were there in slavery for 400 years. You were a slave for 400 years. You didn't own property. You didn't have rights. You were told what to do. You were told when to get up. You were told when to stop working. You were told what you could do. There was nothing whatsoever that you could do. You didn't have mastery over your own life. So they quickly forgot about the goodness of God. This is what they said. They said, why is it that you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? And the elders were told, and I'm sure it went through all of the people, the congregation too, that the reason that the Lord had come to them, that the reason why Moses was sent to them was that they were going to be delivered, they were going to be a free people, and he was going to take them into the land of the Canaanites and all the other ites, and he was going to give them a land flowing with milk and honey. But the temptation, because of the circumstances, they began to tempt or to cast doubt on the character of the Lord. God's intention and his character, because it says in Psalm 95 that it, his work revealed him. They tried me, though they saw my work. God's work reveals his nature and his character. They saw all of the wonders that the Lord did in Egypt to set them free. They saw the Red Sea open up. They walked through on dry land with walls of water on both sides of them. They saw one of the destruction of the world's greatest armies like that. But when they got into a place of harsh circumstance, they completely forgot about the character of and the nature of God that was revealed in all of those acts. Guys, we've got something better in Jesus Christ. Thank God we've got the story of what God has done back in the Old Testament for them. But now we can point to Calvary. We can point to an empty tomb that what God has done through Jesus Christ, we know His character through and through and through. Because Jesus was the exact representation of the Father as He walked upon this earth. And He never turned away anybody, but He went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the enemy. That He came to destroy the works of the devil. Hallelujah. So, let's, let us not forget when we come into a place of difficult circumstance. We come into a place where we're being afflicted. And it seems like, Lord, you're not there. Do you really care? Do you really care about me? Let us remember Jesus. Let us remember what God has spoken. Let us remember Calvary in an empty tomb. That you guys will just stand firm. He just wants you to stand firm in the midst of of that thing wherever you are and count and declare the goodness of God, the faithfulness of God, that God is for me, that the final chapter has not been written yet, that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. God's going to reveal it. God's going to reveal His nature, His character. He's got the timing for it. Things got to be worked out sometimes. There's certainly enemy interference with things. But God's character is steadfast and sure. And even when it looks like it ended in a complete defeat, God can bring resurrection. God can do something that you can't even begin to fathom out of that. He can bring good out of any situation. I want to share a word that I felt like the Lord was laying on my heart this morning. And, it, and it's about worship. It's about worship. It's about what we did tonight, Aaron. 
1 Peter 2, 4 through 5 says this, that we were coming to him as to a living stone. Rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You know, Abraham, when he traveled about, he did two things when he traveled through the land. He would do what? He would build altars and he'd pitch his tent. He'd build an altar. He was going to worship. Wherever God took him, he was going to worship first and foremost. And then secondly, he was going to pitch his tent because you have to have a place to hang your hat, right? Definitely. Guys, we don't build altars anymore, at least not out of stone. But we do build altars. We built an altar tonight, whether you knew that or not. You built an altar. That's why I was saying that the Lord takes it seriously when you're singing a song like that, that you are building an altar and that He comes. I want to help you tonight in the sense of giving you a different perspective possibly of some of the things that you may be going through or have gone through over the past couple years, even maybe longer. You know what? There is a holy fire that comes from God. There's a holy fire that comes from God. There, I also know, though, that there are other fires that you walk into that don't come from God. Okay, so I do want to recognize that because sometimes you get drug into fires that, you know, it's not even by your choice. It's through somebody else's poor decisions or something like that. And you get caught up in the fire. You know what? God doesn't make all fires, but God can use all fire for his glory if you let him. If you invite him into it, he can use it. When we build altars, God responds. God comes to your altar. And what I read in the Bible is he comes to the altar with fire. And some of you may have been feeling the heat. Some of you may be feeling things in your heart God's dealing with. You're in situations and circumstances that, if you could, you can get yourself out of them today. Like, no, I'm in some things that it's like, you know what, if... If I could do it, I'd do it. But you know what? God is working in the midst of that. And when he comes with fire, you are the altar on which the fire burns. Not only are you putting flesh up there for him to burn. Pride, arrogance, fear of man, gossip, lust, you name it, whatever the work of the flesh is, okay, for you. Not only does he come to burn that, but he also, in the process, stones get burnt. That fire is burning on the altar. Some of you have felt the heat of God's fire, and you thought that it was a fire sent by the enemy or a fire or something else, but God has been the fire. He's the one you've offered a sacrifice, and he's responded. He's responded, and he's pleased with that. But in that process, there's a few things that can happen to a stone. Some stones become fortified in the fire. They get harder. They get stronger. Maybe God's doing a work in you on some stones in your life that needs to be fortified, needs to be strengthened. Maybe it's just the determination, the will of, you know what, 
I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm walking with Him. I'm not backing down off of that. There's other stones that in the fire, they burn up. They be disintegrate. They become chalk, ashes in the process. I think those are the stones that if we've got any idols in our life, if we're trying to look to something else, it's really out of Isaiah, Isaiah 27, 9. Those stones become crushed to powder. But you know, there's other stones that become burned and become hardened, but they're covered by the ash that's been left behind of what's been on there. And your perspective is all wrong. You can't see the stone. All you see is the ashes. And so there's heartache and there's grief. But the Holy Spirit comes along and He blows the ashes off. And He unveils. You begin to see the work that God did. Hallelujah. And He gives you a right perspective. God, you are doing something glorious in the midst. And I missed you. And in this work of the Spirit, the enemy can come and taunt you in the process. They taunted Nehemiah and his men when they were rebuilding the temple, rebuilding the wall. And they said, whatever these dudes build over here, a fox is going to run up on it, and it's going to fall down. Nothing's going to be built up there. And they said this, Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish, stones that are burned? Yes, because with God, all things are possible. I wrote this down today. And Aaron, if you want to come, or whoever's playing, hopefully I can get through this. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It says, you have built altars of stone for me, and you have prepared the sacrifice for which I am pleased. And you are surprised that I have come down with fire upon your altar to burn up that which you have given. My children, you have felt the heat of the fire, and you thought it was the fire of the enemy or the fire of displeasure. But I have seen it as an acceptable, pleasing offering, a sweet incense. You have felt the heat from the fire of my pleasure. You have asked me to do a work, and I am doing it, just not in the way that you anticipated. Yes, my fire alters you on the altar. I know exactly what I've come for, that which you have offered. I am pleased, therefore I come in the heat of my presence. That is why I say rejoice in your trials and your tribulations. Let patience have its perfect work so you may be complete, lacking nothing. Yes, you are burned as I meet you in the heat of my presence, but it is with a holy fire for my work. I am doing a glorious work in you. Therefore, you can rejoice. Hallelujah. Can you stand with me tonight? And I want to I wanna pray for you, but then I, I want you to turn to a neighbor and pray for one another. Just that the prophetic word, encouragement, just be released through you to people tonight, just to be encouraging. So Father, we just thank you tonight that Lord, that you do have a holy fire. That Lord God, that you are doing a glorious work in us. And Father, I know that it hurts and there is mystery and there is questions, Lord God through the process. But Lord, we look beyond that and we see a Heavenly Father who supplied everything that we ever needed through Jesus Christ. Lord, Your character is proven. That Lord, that You are good. And so Father, I pray that Lord, that Your people would be strengthened and encouraged, Father, 
and that, Lord, that you would help them just to have an open ear to hear what their advocate, the Holy Spirit, is revealing to them, Lord God. So, Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord God, and we pray your blessing over everyone here. If you can just connect with a person or two right now and just pray for one another and just ask the Lord just to speak through you and to be a blessing.